ready to speak. Well, so, um, me, WC Darcy Gray, Layaway of Wiggy, Mr. Gooch. Just to continue on as others spoke in Big Ma first. Um, I want to first off say wholeheartedly, and, and it's good to be here. Like, I mean, it's really good to be here in Camelton. It's good to see some people I haven't seen in about a year and a half face to face. This is really nice. Uh, and I'm glad we get to do it. And it's beautiful to be here for the event that we are here for. And I want to thank Mindy and Jody. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your heartfelt effort and, and asking the right question. What can we do? What can we do to make a difference? This is an amazing, amazing turnout. And Tommy Fox, who had the idea to walk over here and be part of this, thank you for that. And I don't want to go on and, and, and repeat what others have said before me, but I think the most important part for us to remember is that this is tremendous. Everybody coming out here and showing the strength, coming together, lifts everyone up. It makes us all stronger. But the real work is what we do after today. Can we maintain that position? Can we maintain that effort, that openness, the understanding that you're showing tonight? That is where the real effort and the real change comes from. Asking that question day after day after day. How can I do better? Because the way things were can't continue. And we're not talking about a long time ago. We're talking one generation before me. One generation before me. That's how recent this is. There was an Indian day school over there in our community, right close to the house that, that I live in now. There were people hurt there, one generation before me. But earlier, we had some people dancing, some jingle dress dancers, and I don't know if everybody knows the signal, significance of jingle dress dancing. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it's about healing. It's about sending prayers to the Creator to help those who need it. It's about medicine. That's why we had Jingle Dress Dancers today. And these Jingle Dress Dancers were some of the first students we ever had at our AGS, our Luxidel Gipu School. They grew up there, they learned about who they are, proud of who they are, and that's our future. That's where we're going. We're getting stronger. Thank you for that. They don't know any other way, they just grew up with this. It's beautiful to see. But with that, um, I just want to say again, thank you to everybody who came out here, who showed your support. Je m'excuse que, que j'ai pas tout traduit qu'est-ce que j'ai dit à soir. J'aurais dû, mais je m'excuse. Um, but have, uh, have a safe night, a good night. And Roseanne, I'm going to thank you in advance for the story that you're going to share. It's important that we listen as hard as it may be. just going to let you know in advance. I just want to take this time to honor any of the residential school survivors that are in the audience. I don't want to trigger anybody. And if there's any counselors available to assist people that will need some help, I really believe we need some Kleenex right now because I might lose my uh, my marbles also. Nindela with you, Rosanna. I was called Rosanna when I was younger. I was born in Listuguj and I stayed there for only five years. At the age of five, the Indian agent came to my house and tore me literally from my grandmother's arms while she was sitting on a rocking chair and I was shipped off to uh, Shubanagadi. And I remember that day, it seared in my memory seared in my memory at the age of five, five and a half, somewhere around there. When I went to uh, Shubi, the very first thing that they did was cut my hair. 
and put some of that uh, powdery stuff on there because they thought I had lice. But my grandmother was very, very clean. She was spotless. as where I get the cleaning from today. But uh, they cut my braid. My hair was very, very long. And they, they proceeded to torture us. For me, I was there for almost four years. And day in, day out, I got strapped with yardsticks, pointers, big belts, forced to bend over desks if I wet myself, which I did many, many times. Now visualize this. I want to turn the tables on you. I'm going into your home and taking your children. Each and every one of you. Think about that. Think how it feels not knowing where your child is. And that's what I went through. And so did 54 other people in my community were sent away from 1929 until 1967. We endured a lot of abuse. We weren't allowed to speak our language. And when we spoke our language, we got punished. We got locked up many, many times in, the sh in a little cupboard underneath the stairs. No food, no water, no, no way of using the bathroom. So what did we do? So when they discovered us underneath there, once again, we got punished. It wasn't easy. Three and a half years of abuse. When I came out of there, I was like a wild child. All I wanted to do was punish people. I was hard to handle. When I came home to my grandmother, she cried because I couldn't speak my language. She cried. When I came back to my community, I was so messed up. We didn't have counselors back then, like we do now. So I came back to my community, so messed up. And I got sent away again. I got sent away to Gatsby for another nine years. So in all, I, I spent 14 years away from my community. And when I came back at the age of 19, I was a mess. I was a total mess. I didn't know how to parent. I didn't know how to love children because it was never shown to me. I punished my children with an iron rod. And for those survivors that are out there, you know what I'm talking about. You know, it was only a few years after I had my first child when Shawnee Ann came around that Donna's mother walked in on me punishing my child. And she told me, Rose, that's an only parent. And it's like somebody just threw water in my face because I realized, Jesus, maybe I'm doing something wrong. I became the worst alcoholic, drug addict. I went down the wrong path for many, many years until I almost died because of all the trauma that I was going through and all that. My life wasn't easy and I didn't make it easy. But when you get the last rites five times in a row, you sort of wake up a little bit. That's what residential schools did to me. I don't know about the other survivors, but all I know is every one of us had a hard life. A lot of people moved to the States. A lot of people moved away. When I came back to my community, I was very young. I turned to alcohol and drugs to escape what I had been going through. <coughs> so when I first heard about these babies in British Columbia, you know the sad part of it is I was there two years ago. I went to that school. I had my picture taken outside that school. Not realizing that two years later that they would discover these babies' bodies. So that's why I said I carry it. I carry that pain deep inside. We had a sweat lodge put up in our community. And that second sweat is where I had that vision about angels coming up. I spoke to one of the girls that did Reiki on me because I was so messed up. And I told her what I experienced. I seen angels floating up to heaven. And a couple of weeks later, 
they uncovered those bodies. And you know what the sad part of it is so far? It's 1,505. There's going to be thousands, thousands. Out of 130, 34 schools across Canada, there's going to be more. You know, I was 39 years old when I had the last rites for the fifth time. And uh, that's when I realized I couldn't continue the party life anymore. I had to give up. And I turned to my sister because she had already been sober for one year and all that. And uh, She dragged me off to the meetings, I hated them. Went to sweats, I hated them. Took me a long time to get that balance back in my life. And once I started going to sweats, that's where I realized, oh my God, this is where I belong. I started learning my teachings with the uh, elder Earl Lavillowa. I've been following him for going on 28 years. He's my teacher. He taught me how. And the sad part of it that for him, he's also a survivor. His parents were, his father was a residential school survivor. I thought it was coming over. You know, over it's time for all of us to work together. And one thing I've noticed right now, the I'm curriculum right in the yeah, schools yeah. needs to change. It needs to change. The true history of our people needs to be told. No more putting it under the rug. Canada has to pay. And they're going to pay heavily. If I have the opportunity of moving back to Ottawa, I'll be on that hill every day until Trudeau does something. My son is in BC right now studying to be a indigenous social worker. And I told him straight out, you need to deal with your shit first before you can get out there and deal with somebody else's. You need to clean the plate. You know, my, my plate is not clean yet. It's a lifetime journey. When I put down that bottle and I put down those drugs and I put down those pills, I made a pact with the creator. You guide me and I'll do what, I, what needs to be done to educate the people. I looked at these dancers today. I look at the children and I see spirits all around them. And some of them are old souls because they understand what I'm trying to get across. We need to educate the public, not just Camelton, the entire, entire universe. We need to educate them what our people have gone through from the early, from the late 1800s to 1995 when they closed the last residential school. And I pray that I live long enough to see these changes. Right now, I can't speak enough. Everywhere I've traveled, I share about my story. I share about what I had gone through. And if I can change and start that healing process, and so can the next seven generations. We don't have to turn like. You know, we often wonder why our people are so messed up. Huh? Ask Canada that. Why our people are so messed up? So, 1994 was the day that I, May 25th, I put down the bottle because I found out my daughter was pregnant with uh, my first grandchild. And I swore to God, if there's a creator up above, I swore that my grandchildren would never see me. 
under the influence of alcohol or drugs ever again. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. There are many times I just want to chuck everything and say, the hell with it. Give me that bottle. But you know something, I learned a lot of things because of what the elders have taught me. I don't want to lose my bundle. I don't want to lose my eagle feathers. I don't want to lose my medicines. It took me so hard. It took me so long to earn them. I ask the Creator every day. I pray morning, noon, and night. When I'm having a hard time and things aren't jiving the way I want, they always say self will run right. Well, there are times my head goes into crazy mode, which is uh, near the full moon. And the, the, the funny part of it is, I teach a lot of women about ceremony today. I lead a lot of people to the water. I lead a lot of people in the lodge. I lead a lot of people in whatever ceremonies that they want to know. I've traveled the last three years. I've hit 10 provinces. I thank Native Women's Association of Canada for taking me out. They didn't know how messed up I was because I'm very outspoken. I shoot from the hip. I don't lie. I tell it like it is. And many, many times I sat with the government tables and told them off. That's not how you do it. You don't dictate to us. We dictate to you. You're on our territory. This is Mi'kmaq unseated territory. We are the bosses, not you. You sit on our money. <laughs> Probably won't get shot for this now. <laughs> I want to thank you. I also want to take this come. Wow, oh wow. Guardian Angel. You know, I did a ceremony today in the in the Stigwood. We had to uh, do a ceremony for one of our elders who passed in uh, February. And as I looked up at the sky, there was a guardian angel in the shape in the clouds. And I nudged Chad, wherever he is. Over here. <laughs> I nudged him. I said, there's an angel looking down on us. There's Bobby looking down on us. He's like, holy cow. Our spirits are everywhere, you know? I look around at these young babies. Last week, uh, last weekend, I was in uh, Gaspe territory, and I was honored there to do a naming ceremony for their little boy. See, I was brought up in Gaspe for nine years, so I have a foster family over there, and they asked me if I would do a spirit naming for one of their... Uh, children and I was honored to do it so as I was doing the ceremony I realized this is the first kid first Mi'kmaq kid that's got a naming uh, in Gaspe in the Gaspe region the little child made history he's only a year and a half he don't know nothing but you know something I've been invited back since I got 10 more to 10 more to do this summer and I know it's going to escalate even more so I'm very grateful that you all came out. I wasn't expecting this turnout. I thought maybe about 25 to 30 people will show up, but this blew the socks right off me. <laughs> well, I'll yuck. Yeah, and you know something? Take some time out, like two minutes and 15 seconds, and reflect on those babies that first were discovered, because there's gonna be more. There's gonna be thousands more. So expect that. We're gonna have ceremonies going like crazy all summer long, praying for these children, praying for their ancestors that didn't have a chance. They didn't have a life. We don't even know where some of them were. I'm gonna tell you a story. I worked in Nova Scotia in 2003, 2005, and my uh, mandate at the time was traveling to 44 different reserves getting the impact statements from residential school survivors. And some of the stories that uh, I heard were horrendous. And I'll tell you one that stays in my, here for the rest of my life. We had a chance to interview this uh, 60 some odd year old man. And uh, he didn't know how to read. He didn't know how to write. All he knew how was to make an X. So when it came time for his impact statement, he asked us, we asked him all kinds of questions and all that, and what he disclosed at that time was he witnessed one of the babies that were brought 
were brought down, wrapped in a bundle, still squirming. And he was forced to put that baby in the incinerator. Think about that. And I'll never forget that story because it hit me so bad here. I had to go out and get help from the elders that were around. And that's just one. There's more. These stories that are going to be coming out in the near future is going to mortify a lot of you people. Now think of it as if it was your own children. Today, I, I carry those scars and I'll carry them for the rest of my life. In closing, I want to I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to my story. I'm sorry if I was a little abrupt or if I triggered anybody, but this is what I had gone through. We thank everybody again for coming this evening. Merci beaucoup à tout le monde d'avoir venu à soir. We're going to finish off the evening with uh, Elder Martin. We'll say a prayer. And like we said earlier, keep the conversation going. It doesn't end here tonight. It's only the start. <laughs> Should have just kept the mic. Gisult. Mokchiniska. Wegwal Darcy. Tandel Maui Daya Gabi Gay Gis for Blood Ed Gay Wala. A big sick to we? A big sick to we? A big sick to we? Shouldn't do away with you. And there's a good name, Bemad one. Gay Gis Cook. They would make the work, Gigi Wala, off the Bemad work. Oh, easy way look. Well, Darcy, if today, Gabi Gay Bay Dabin, Gay Wala, Blood Ed. The Bibon Gis in the Gay Gis Cook. Kit Cook to Jaramid Juk Chibenu, Kizia by the Docks of Nigay. Aksikti will all in. Which it mulgig and oldy, he's again we out nigay will lock. Will all in chitna. So we have a bit of cadets no gay bed of extra jaramish. He'll no jordan and nagar and nadel, of chit abijik. He's a by that ox of nigay. Will all in chit age, ask with the muggle. Will all in. Tandel maui die of nigay, his cooker dead. Will all the extra. Makta wake we not cast no chin and wake to jaramish. He'll beg his inudo. And it's going to be until Canada comes together and tries to resolve this, this issue, this Canada issue. Well, <laughs> So basically, in a nutshell, what I did was I send the ancestors back in a good way so that nobody gets hurt, nobody gets harmed. I look around at everybody at the sea of orange, and the funny thing is, I hate orange. <laughs> Yet I got an orange regalia on with the Lord. <laughs> I'm bad, eh? And Kijin and Makamigo will all in today and Pisun Gekun and Migagis who will all in Chilabigo will all your Tandel Bay Dio of a Jixi to be only gay will all let it. Tandes with your Nokoma. Aho! Gross. <laughs>
hot flash. <laughs> Yeah, I'll come in.